Um, we're going to take a look at what ecofascism is and what and what it had to do with the Buffalo shooting. Now, a social scientist Joseph Henderson, um, basically, um, he um, basically the Buffalo shooter actually believed he was helping save the planet in reality, which he was not. Um, for years, social scientists have warned that mass shootings can be contagious, which they are, and tens of media coverage, particularly when a shooter's name and face become widely known can serve as either an incentive to would-be copycats seeking the same notoriety, and likewise the motivations for mass killing events can be contagious as well, particularly when perpetrators leave behind, a gra um, leave behind grand um, grandiose manifestos that inspire or directly call on others to follow their suit. Um, that's, that's, that's doubly true, doubly, sorry, doubly true, of the massacre that took place last Saturday when an 18-year-old um, white, <coughs> white supremacist man from, um, from New York's southern tier traveled to Buffalo to target a supermarket in a predominantly black neighborhood, killing 10 people and wounding three others. The shooting was only the latest in a series of mass killing attacks in recent years that was driven by white nationalism, the replacement theory, which holds that there is an orchestrated effort to replace white people in Europe, North America, and elsewhere with non-white immigrants or, for that matter, non-white citizens. It's the same theory that was, that was cited by the killers who targeted Muslims in Christchurch, New Zealand, um, basically, Latinos in El Paso, Texas, Jews in Pittsburgh, um, Pennsylvania, and socialists in Norway. Now, these days, you can readily find the theory, the theory reflected in the highest-rated cable news show, cable cable news show on TV, the fake news channel, um, foe, or in the mouths of, uh, or in, from the mouths of leading Republicans, charging that Democrats seek to replace white white Americans with immigrants who will fundamentally change the country's demographics and also become reliable Democratic voters. Which that's also not true on that part. Now, link to link to that is the call for more white white kids, as the Buffalo shooter wrote in the manifesto he posted online before the massacre. Much of which it turns out was plagiarized from the Christchurch shooter's screed. If there's one thing I want you to get from these write-ins, it's that white is that the white birth ra um, rates must change. Now, further down the line in the 180-page turnout um, document, a seemingly unrelated idea appears as well. The shooter represents himself as driven by as driven by environmental concerns. Alongside genocidal threats to non-whites on white lands, leave while you still can. The shooter decries the environmental impact of cryptocurrency mining and laments that the natural environment has become industrialized, pulverized, and commoditized. In a section entitled Green National Nationalism is the only true nationalism, he declares, there is no conservatism without nature, and there is no nationalism without environmentalism. Now, the protection and preservation of these lands is of the same importance as the protection and preservation of our own ideals and beliefs. Hey, um, the shooter goes. The shooter goes on to argue that there is no green future with never end, with never ending population growth that continued that continued immigration into Europe as environmental warfare, and that there can be no traditionalism without environmentalism. A political research associate researcher and salon contributor, Ben Lorber, has pointed this out. Most of these passages are not were not from the Buffalo shooter's own words, but they were lifted wholesale from the Christchurch shooter's manifesto. And like the Christchurch shooter, Wummy cites his inspiration, the Buffalo shooter declares himself an eco fascist. Um, the ideology of eco fascism, which combines the far right authoritarian politics with environmental concerns or climate issues, represents an increasingly common thread in incidents of massive right wing violence. As Alex Amend, a researcher on the far right, noted in the 2020 report in The Killing, and the, and the, sorry, in the public eye, there has been a murderous daisy chain of mass killings linked to both replacement theory and ecofascism, going back to 2011 with the massacre of 77 people in Norway by a man who blamed socialists for enabling the third world population that was threatening to overtake Europe and who called for radical policies to reduce the global population to less than 3 billion people. The Norwegian massacre inspired the Christchurch shooter, um, who declared that immigration, demographics, and environmentalism were all, were all inextricably bound, writing that they were the same issue, and the invaders are the ones overpopulated in the world. Kill the invaders, kill the overpopulation, and by doing so, save the environment. The Christchurch shooter, in turn, inspired the El Paso shooter, who explained in his manifesto that he sought to kill invaders in order to address a worsening environment and an able and more sustainable way of life. This is no longer, there's no longer history to this, um, um, amen, right? This dates back to the 19th century German nationalist whose, um, whose naturalist mytholo um, mythology binding the German soil and, and bulk led to a version of the right-wing environmentalism that tied protection of the land to an exclusionary sense of who should inhabit the land. Now these days, um, now these days, Joseph Henderson says, he's an, um, basically he's an environmental socialist scientist 
at Paul Smith's College in northern New York. This sort of sentiment is showing up not just in the screeds left behind by mass killers, but also in classrooms and in some mainstream environment, environmentalist, um, environmentalist um, rhetoric. As a specialist in ecofascism as well as the anthropology of environmental education, Henderson says that he's deeply worried that, they're starting, that, 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 ever, that we're starting to see fascist responses to climate change, and he basically said this when he spoke with Salon this week. Basically, basically, people started researching this issue. A couple of years ago, we had a student, a young white man, who wrote a paper about how the solution to climate change is essentially genocide. Um, we needed to secure the homeland for whites and who have to have access to resources. Um, I have never seen that argument before, and one of the, fund- one of the, one of the fundamental questions we ask, if you're, if you're an anthropologist, that is, who studies learning, is what's the ecosystem that produces something like that, and where was he getting these ideas? Basically, the teacher started meeting with the kid what, um, weekly and trying to understand him. He was a member of one of the groups on the ground in Charlottesville, Virginia, during the deadly 2017 um, Unite, um, the, the pathetic un- Unite the Right Clan rally, and he was an alienated young white man in search of a meaning with untreated mental health issues in an area where mental health ca- where, where, where mental health care is scarce. And he would sit online and get drunk and watch really horrific videos on 4chan and 8chan and mass shooting videos. Basically, the teacher had no training in de-radicalization, but he was trying to help the kid to see that he was being taken advantage of and that there were people preying upon him. And from that... We started reading about ecofascism and how, and how environmental studies um, itself is rooted in and perpetuates some of these things. Reading the Buffalo Shooters Manifesto, it's disjointed and all over the place like these things um, usually are, but the personality um, type strikes me as very similar. On the basic level, we're going to break down what ecofascism is. It's an appropriation of nature for reactionary political purposes. It's related to, e- um, to um, um, ethno ethno nationalism and authoritarianism because it's about the construction of the nation of the nation state as a as a um, as a geographic area so it makes nation nation state claims to be to um, to nature if we think about the Charlottesville guys they were chanting blood and soil and there's a long history of this the nazis had a had, the nazis had a land ethic that was related to this whole particular issue but there's this conception of natural purity and racial purity or you also have gender purity or ethnic purity and that goes a long way with this. For me, it's fundamentally about who gets to claim the land and for what particular reason are they claiming that land for. Now, people, people often assume that environmentalism and climate change are issues only associated with the Democrats, which is not true either. In, a, in an environmental study, we tend to talk about environmentalisms and, there, and that there are different kinds of environmental, environmental ideologies and differences within the Democratic versions of them. In the United States, it has mostly been people on the Democratic side, at least since Nixon, who have been concerned with environmentalism as a political project. And there is a long history of how the Republican Party turned away from, from environmentalism, and they became actively hostile to it, um, to, it, at, to it as its own counter-movement and political strategy. Although that's complicated, too, because there are right-leaning conservati- um, conservati- um, cons- conservation groups and things like that, but climate change denial has predominantly been a right-wing phenomenon in this country for years. Um, the reason that we are really concerned about ecofascism is that we're starting to see um, see this rise. A lot of people assume that if we teach people about climate change, that they will want to create a world that is more just and peaceful, and that's really ideologically blinkered. My, um, this student who was an ecofascist fully understood the science of climate change. He got it, but he took it places that were that were illiberal, authoritarian, and anti-democratic. It doesn't follow that. It doesn't follow that if you teach people about climate change, they're all of a sudden going to create a world that is more just or peaceful. They're going to integrate it into their existing politics. And what we're starting to see, especially among the more fringe elements of the right wing, is that there is an awareness of climate change and that they're taking it to these more fascist, anti-democratic ways. If you look at El Paso, um, there is a, there is a through line between him and the New Zealand mosque, mosque shooter. A lot of these guys look to the New Zealand um, mosque shooter. Or the guy in Norway, uh, or the guy in Norway as oracles, um, they they look to them for education. They're a community of practice. If you want to use the anthropology term, it's an online decentralized community of practice where they learn these things, seek notoriety, and they stream their violence. And when you read these manifestos, they take um, they take environmental environmental seriously, but from a right, from a right wing perspective. Um, 
now we're um, now we're wondering how ecofascism relates to the larger focus on the replacement theory and ethno nationalism. Now I tend to see white um, supremacist movements as materially as materially oriented as much as culturally oriented. Now if you look at something like the U.S. Constitution, which preferences white land landholders or the system of U.S. slavery or settler colonial genocide and the destruction of indigenous people on their lands, a lot of a lot of that is about the race about the racist control of land. Anthropologically speaking, land is a source of value as a source of production. So what ties these things together is the need to control. The need to control land, the need to control other people in the service of that land, and the need to, be not, and the need to not be controlled. It's about being the people who control others in service of this larger social arrangement and economic system. Now to tie that to climate change, we are in a present and, and, and heading toward a future where there are going to be really serious contest um, cont contest over resources, and this is nothing new. We've been colonializing lands of black and brown people for a long, long time, and the more intense climate change becomes, the uglier it's going to fucking get. The guy targeted this area of Buffalo because of its ra of its racial composition. There is a jargony term in anthropology, necropolitics, which basically means who is disposable in, in, in our society, and who must suffer in order for others to survive. And Buffalo is a place of intense racial and economic segregation, and we basically live in a society that treats minority populations as, as disposable. And there's this tendency to look at these events as if they're out of the ordinary, but, how, but look how we treat black life in this country. Heavily policed, more likely to die from COVID, higher levels of environmental pollution, um, doctors don't take their claims to pain or health as seriously, and this is a particularly nasty version of what's a much larger pattern of disposability in this fucking country. Elise Stefanik, who's the representative in um in in um in that area, is literally out there tw this morning tw um, tw um 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 this morning tweeting the same tweeting this morning the same kind of shit. You can't draw a direct line between Stefanik's speech and what this guy did, but there are bro but there are broader social conditions that legitimize it, and there are people doubling down on replacement theory today. And there's recent polling that says something like 30 percent of Americans believe in the replacement theory. Um, and 50% of Republicans also believe that, but I think that that's a I think that's a reflection of the fact that we're becoming a more diverse country, and people are tapping into a fear of losing power. The research on this isn't on numbers or percentages, but I think that there are a lot of unex um, unex unexamined assumptions in modern environmentalism that feed into these things. Within environmentalism, there are a lot of um, ap apocalyptic narratives. The world is ending. We're all fucking screwed. Some scholarship shows up. That when uh, shows shows up that when when you surround people with apocalyptic narratives, it tends to provoke an authoritarian response because people seem to seek out an order. And if they feel like the world is being disordered, they want something to come in, often a kind of father figure, to reestablish this order. You see this in so, in societies like um like Brazil like Brazil with Bolsonaro and with Trump as well. But Trump isn't really a father figure, and he didn't really establish anything while he was squatting in the whales. So I think um some of the apocalypse apocal Apoca um, apocalyptism coming out of environmentalism can be dangerous. One of the huge issues that we're facing here in environmental studies is the fixation on population and population control. When people talk casually to students about any uh, about anything like environmental problems and ask what's the solution, overwhelmingly they, they say it's population control and there's too many humans we need to thin the herd. What's interesting about this is that they're never talking about themselves, even though when you look at who's, um, who impacts the ecosystem the most, it tends to be white people with high incomes. Population control and, and, and eugenics have long targeted social, um, the racial minorities, women, and indigenous people. One of the, stu one of the students, who's now a co-author, Brown Wynn Bishop, did a qu um, qualitative an analysis of research papers that were handed out at a recent wildlife bi um, biology conference. And it was all this really nasty population control, anti-immigrant, invasive species rhetoric. To refer to humans, the broader theme is this very anti, what they call human rhetoric, and you can see that in the extremist literature. The thing I'm more interested in, and the, that I'm more interested in, more interested in, is not the extremes, but how it manifests in everyday context. The students, most of whom are not extremists, still have these ideals that they are kind of eco-fascist adjacent, and there are other ideals like purity logics. Where nature, um, where nature is sacred and humans are impure, that very quickly goes into things like racial pu um, purity logics and race science. There's some, we do need, we do need to, we do need to do something to start addressing this. When you think about climate change, um, you have to also think about things like democracy and how those things are related. 
Um, we need to be honest about some of the root causes of these problems, like settler, like settler colonialism and like racial capitalism. Like the continued um, need to dominate nature and other people, you can't address these issues unless you understand the root causes behind both. When, um, when the teacher taught climate change, he taught it as, a, he taught it as an artifact of, a coloni of colonialism and that it's mostly white, wealthy nations building themselves in the back of others. And when you look at where climate denial is, it's in those nations. And when, I took, when he took the students to South Africa, he asked the government minister, do you have climate deniers here? He said, we don't have the privilege of climate denial. And that has sat with, and that has sat with the teacher for a while. But if you like the video, give the video a like and subscribe to my channel, RBW King. And you can also hit the notification bell so that you'll be notified when a new video comes out. If you want to support my work even further, um, you can donate to my Patreon link, which you can find in the About section of YouTube. And just for as little as a few bucks a month, you can donate to the channel. And thanks for listening.